Okay. My name's Ron Fithian. I'm president of the Board of County Commissioners of Kent County, and I'd like to welcome everybody here today to talk about the uh, Upper Shore Community Mental Health Facility. Um, appreciate everybody coming. Um, we'll want to have a seat. We'll all first probably. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Our Health Officer, Mr. Bill Webb, to to conduct the meeting. But I thought maybe when everybody gets seated, we'll go around and introduce everybody. Introduce herself so we know just who all's here. How about that? Okay. Um, you want to you want to start? Introduce yourself, and we'll go right <laughs> okay. around. Uh, I am Brian Morose. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Operations for the Maryland Department of Health. Mike Detmer, I'm the Vice President, uh, and I represent District 5 for the Dorchester County Council. Uh, welcome. Um, Chuck Callahan, I'm the President of Public County Council. Thank you all for being here. I'm Patrick McLaughlin, County Commissioner in District 2 for Family and Health. And I'm Shelley Heller, I'm the County Administrator for Kent County. And I'm also going to be asking everybody to speak into a microphone when you do speak. And I'm going to bring a microphone um, down into the audience for introductions. And that way, the people that are listening on Teams will be able to hear you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Webb. I am the health officer for the Kent County Health Department. And thank you. Thank you for being here. And then we could start down on the front row and go and everybody just go around the room. Good morning, everyone. I am Emily Keller, the Special Secretary of Opioid Response for the Moore Miller Administration. Good morning, everyone. Teresa Heath, Deputy Director for the Opioid Operational Command Center. Good morning. I'm Cassie Hirschberger. I am the Executive Associate for the OCC. Uh, good morning. I'm Erin McMullen. I'm Chief of Staff at the Maryland Department of Health. Hello, my name is Will Andalora. I'm the director for the Office of Facilities Management and Development, Department of Health. Hi, good morning. This is Brenna Fox, Local Addictions Authority, Kent County. Hi, good morning. Katie Dilley, uh, Executive Director, Midshore Behavioral Health. <clears throat> good morning. I am Carla Thorpe, the director of the AF Whitsitt Center. Good morning. I'm Lauren Levy. I'm the health officer for Cecil County. Good morning, I'm Kathy Wright. I'm a volunteer for the Queen Anne's County Drug Free Coalition and a retired licensed clinical alcohol drug counselor. Uh, Warren Wright, Chief Drag me here. I'm a volunteer for the Queen Anne's County Drug Free <laughs> Coalition. <laughs> Joe Ciotola, Queen Anne County Health Officer and EMS Medical Director. Good morning, I'm Roger Harrell, County Health Officer, Dorchester County. Welcome to the shore. I'm Doug Massey, Queen Anne's County. I'm a volunteer at the AF Whitsitt Center. David Foster, Mayor of Chestertown. Todd Mon, County Administrator, Queen Anne's County. Jay Jacobs, Delegate, District 36. Mike Arns, uh, Community Liaison for Congressman Andy Harris. And I'm Clay Stamp, County Manager for Talbot County. Can end back up here because we have a new commissioner joining us. Jim Moran, Queen Anne's County at Large Commissioner. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bill Webb, and uh, he'll 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 get us started. Okay, excellent. Uh, I just want to uh, make sure that everybody can see the agenda, and uh, I have a present a presentation that just sort of lays out the, our objective today is to do some strategic planning related to the Upper Shore Behavioral Mental Health Center. Um, the facility is, uh, you know, is currently providing a number of behavioral health services and it has some vacancies. And really what we wanted to do today is, you know, decide how the, not decide, but, you know, get input from the community related to what we want that facility to do to advance the well-being of our region. Uh, and I think that, that most of this meeting, you know, is going to be an opportunity to get input from the audience and the participants. Uh, we want to hear from, from you. Uh, and 
but before we do that, we have a presentation by Katie Dilly, who is going to you know, provide some, some, uh, some of the data and what, what Midshore Behavioral Health has been tracking specifically related to the behavioral health needs of the region. Uh, it is you know, a, very, uh, a very good presentation and it provides the groundwork for really what, what the needs of our region represent. So uh, we're also gonna uh, you know, have, have uh, Brian Ross speak uh, when Katie is done. What I do ask is that everybody that wants to speak, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Please sign up so that we know that, that you're interested in speaking. You know, I ask that, that those who are speaking, please you know, limit your comments uh, to you know, it, be fairly brief because we do want to get to everybody today. Everybody's opinion is important and we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to have your say. So uh, if you are attending remotely, we ask that you indicate uh, in the chat box that you want to speak, and we will get to you uh, after, we, after we do everybody who's here in person. And if there are issues for our remote viewers, please put that in the chat box as well. So uh, thank you for your time, and, and uh, I will, oh, the other important item that I wanted to say is that we will be accepting written input if our, if our citizens or anyone else who is unable to attend today, I, you know, we are accepting you know, submissions you know, in, until I think I, Friday, June 2nd. We wanna make sure that everybody has an opportunity to provide input in what that facility you know, is for the Eastern Shore and the Upper Shore region. So uh, my presentation has the you know, the, my email address and also the physical mailing address if you want to send written comments. So uh, mm -hmm. we are accepting written submissions as well for anybody who may be, you know, not here or have missed the meeting. So with that, I will then, I guess, turn it over to, to Katie to give a, her presentation on, on the, you know, behavioral health in, data on the shore. So take it away, Katie. This conversation today and, and the conversations that will follow really need to be data driven. And um, so I could have gone through all of the different providers we have in the region and what they do and who they are and where they're established, but I think our constituents and how they're showing up with their needs is really what we need to think about this morning and how we make our plans and, and really support how we sustain the facility um, at the AF Lipsic Center as well as serve our community. Really appreciate the support um, of the Department of 
health, with being our partner in this process, and all of you that are here in the room today. I do think it's important to note that a lot of the services that I will be <coughs> presenting this morning, in particular our crisis response system um, on the Eastern Shore is actually a nine county um, system. So the funding and the oversight for all of our crisis response services comes out of Wisdom Behavioral Health. So we do the planning around that and the work with affiliated conferences who is our vendor. So I think we will get into crisis data this morning. I think it's important to see how folks when they're really at their most critical moments are showing up in the community. So we'll, we'll see some of that information as well today. Okay, so we'll start with just a regional overview. Um, get into our public behavioral health system utilization. We have some CRISP information as well as our suicide and overdoses. As I said, our crisis response and our child and adolescent specific data that I think will be interesting to, to look at today as, as a part of the session. So this is just a snapshot of census data. Um, so you can kind of get a feeling for those of you who aren't as familiar in the room with our midshore um, makeup of how many of us there are and how our demographic looks um, in, in comparison to the state. So we have 172,614 residents. I'm sure that number has grown since the census, but um, we are a large territory with not too too many people um, necessarily represented, but a lot a lot of a footprint here in terms of our geography. Um, but that also presents as a challenge as for those of us who live here and work here and have tried to do planning. Rural communities can be very difficult to meet the needs of, so we've had to get creative with how we do that with our telehealth services, as well as um, our, our teams that actually go out and meet with folks in person. So a lot of what we do at Midshore Behavioral Health and in our local behavioral health authority capacity is we work and serve our public behavioral health consumers. So those are individuals that receive Medicaid um, primarily. Of course, we plan for the system to meet all of us um, in the community insurance as well, but our primary focus is really looking at our Medicaid population and how we're serving that uh, group. And that's the data that as local authorities, we are privileged to receive from our administrative service organization in our state um, to help us figure out how to plan for the system. So this is a snapshot of how many Medicaid eligible individuals live in the Midshore compared to the state. You can see that we, on average, um, as a five county region, are at 31% Medi Medicaid eligible compared to the state average at 28%. But I think it's really interesting to point out that we have a couple of counties that almost half of our population are Medicaid eligible. So both Caroline and Dorchester counties have significantly high percentages of Medicaid eligible individuals compared to the state average. So in Dorchester, you see we have 40% of our individuals that are eligible, and then Caroline County, we have 43%. So of that population that is eligible for Medicaid, and those that actually utilize the benefit, we're gonna talk a little bit about who is accessing services of that group. So this is a county breakdown of those individuals that are Medicaid recipients, are they accessing mental health services? So out of our Medicaid utilizers here in the region, we actually have a higher average of individuals that are accessing services for mental health. So we have 
of our Medicaid population as we fill in their core region, getting services to support their mental health needs. Um, that's compared to 14% statewide. And so you can just see those down there as you can. Uh, similarly, this is our substance use data. Uh, so this is our population that is receiving Medicaid um, that are accessing substance use services. So we've got 8% of our mature uh, residents that are receiving substance use services uh, as compared to 6% of the state. Uh, I thought one statistic is interesting. We've got King County at 11%, and I do believe there might have something to do with the Kent County uh, facility here, our AF Wixit Center being available for our Kent County residents, so they're actually probably accessing a lot more support just because of that facility being in their proximity to the photo. So these, this is a snapshot of our consumer totals to kind of break down what does that percentage mean, how many folks are being served. Um, so as a total, you see that uh, we've got our county um, broken out and oops, I'm going there. Um, and then compared to um, our it's both counties and your total total. So we've got our fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22. So for mental health in fiscal year 22, we had 9,067 individuals that received mental health services. And for substance use, it was 4,174 individuals as a total from the mature to seasoned age group. So you, the question is, what exactly are people going to services to have their support needs met? So this is a breakdown by service type of what is actually happening with those folks. So um, you can see the majority of individuals, um, and this is a positive thing, are accessing services from an outpatient provider. So this is a breakdown of our mental health services. Um, that is our number one um, mm -hmm. utilized resource here in the region. So the second was our psychiatric rehabilitation, um, and we have our inpatient needs, and case management and mobile treatment and EBT just through the system of the different services. But um, we have had an increase over the last couple of years by 7% in individuals that are accessing services. We do have information on the cost of these services. We've actually had a fluctuation down um, in the last couple of years uh, since the peak of COVID and how much folks are utilizing their benefit, how expensive their services are, which is a positive thing to see because that usually means that it's less acute, what type of care they're needing. And this is a similar breakdown for our substance use consumers by service. Uh, the number one service for the substance use uh, providers is just lab, our lab um, processing, followed by our outpatient services, and our opioid maintenance treatment programs. Um, and then you can see our residential services are also um, being utilized at a higher rate. And there's been a 3% increase over the last uh, two fiscal years we have the data um, with the substance use services. Okay, so kind of shifting gears a little bit away from our public behavioral health systems data to look at how folks are showing up in our emergency departments in our University of Maryland core regional health system. I thought that would be really interesting to look at. Um, so this is everybody. This isn't just our Medicaid population. This is the whole community and how they're showing up. So this uh, graphic is actually, um, uh, I borrowed it from University of Maryland core regional health's uh, most recent needs assessment. But I thought it was really interesting to see that the top health problems presenting in our hospital system serving this community are mental health, primarily depression and anxiety, and then a close second to that are um, folks presenting with alcohol or substance use needs. So that's, that's very eye-opening. You know, so we've got individuals presenting with cardiac issues well below how folks are showing up to the, the emergency departments with needing help for their mental health. So that's, that's something that all of us, I think, should pause and really reflect on because that's daunting to think about a hospital system that really should be the last place someone ends up because hopefully we're serving
serving them well in the community, but yet it's still our number one primary preventive need as they show up in our emergency department. We do have access to our Chesapeake Regional Information System for patients, our CRIP data. So we have populated just a snapshot of a few different age groups as well as presenting needs to demonstrate um, when folks are in the emergency room, what are they showing up with? So this is a breakdown for any mental health condition here um, in our uh, hospital network here in the region. So you see there's the Maryland totals compared to the mid-core. Um, and we do have a steady increase of the over the last three years. So the rate of how folks are showing up is increasing. Now this is a breakdown by age group. And this is an interesting slide. Um, you will see that we've got the age groups broken out by 0 to 17, 18 to 64, which is very broad, and then 65 and above. Um, the top two populations that are showing up in need in our emergency department, are number one is our 18 to 24 year old group. Lots of us refer to that age group as transitional age youth. Um, in the close second up is our uh, population that's 10 to 14 years old. Um, and this is for mental health conditions. So we've got a lot of young people ending up in the emergency department that need help for their mental health. And then there's their peer group that's just a little bit older. Um, the, that to me is something that I think will help our conversation here today is really looking at that age group and how they're showing up in our emergency department. So for any substance use conditions, um, the numbers are fairly consistent over the last three years. Um, we've got Maryland compared to the mid-core. So those are our individuals that are presenting in the emergency department with the substance use uh, service needs. And I'll break that out a little bit more by age group. So like I, similarly with our mental health data, I've broken it out by those three age uh, categories again. Um, we've got the most need uh, presenting with our 18 to 24 year old group. Um, and following up to that, um, is our zero to 14 years. So we've got 18 to 24 year olds, that's 13.45%. And zero to 14 years, or excuse me, 10 to 14 years at 11.31%. So that's very young when you think about it, to have individuals having substance use exposure and need to present in the emergency department, but we're seeing that. And these are all mid-core residents. So I dove a little bit deeper here into our zero to 17 population and as to what exactly are we seeing as the primary presenting issue with this group. Um, the most recent data for the um, image on the left is in yellow. So the primary issue that we're seeing is depression in this population, followed by individuals showing up into the emergency department presenting with self-harm activities. And then uh, following that, we have our anxiety issues showing up as well. Um, the image on the right is really just a, a broader snapshot of how there's our, <coughs> this population is showing up in terms of mental health and substance use. So we're seeing um, our largest population is that 15 to 17 year old group showing up with substance use needs and our 10 to 14 year olds are showing up with mental health needs primarily. I know this is all about information. I will be happy to share the PowerPoints because it's a lot to digest. Um, I wanted to do just a snapshot of our regional information for both suicides and overdoses. We can get a lot more into detail if you all want to have follow-up with both of these groups of data, but I wanted to at least represent what we're seeing um, in terms of our folks that are losing their lives to mental health or substance use uh, to need. So this is our overall data for the region, um, broken out by totals. Um, over the last three years of individuals that have consumed
committed suicide, and I did break it out by um, the zero to 17 and 18 and older group. So we did see in uh, fiscal year 21, 12% of our suicides in the region were a zero to 17 population. Um, this past year, 100% of our suicides were um, up 18 and older. Um, and then you can see in the right on the right side, it's just a breakdown of how the NOPES are compared to the state in terms of demographic and age group. Um, you'll see it continue to break it down. So NOPES is our overdose data in the region. Um, and I wanna just thank our um, mentor, local addictions authority, because we rely on our health departments to help us get this information. Um, and both the suicide information and overdoses can be tricky to, to track. So we take a lot of that into consideration how we interpret it. So we've got our total um, overdoses. Um, <coughs> most recently, we've got an FY21 and F65. Um, and then on the right, you can see us a breakdown of our non-fatal overdoses that are ending up in the hospital. So that's actually data from our um, CRIP system. We do have a significant number of individuals that are still showing up um, following an overdose in the emergency department level of care. Um, all right. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about crisis services. So this image is a breakdown of how we see our crisis response system working. Uh, we do need to update it to add 988 because that's an amazing resource that is now part of our network. Um, but we have a Eastern Shore crisis response system that is, uh, begins with a hotline. So we have our Eastern Shore Operations Center, which we say is really our gateway to services. So if folks call that number, you can get an urgent care appointment, you can be provided with resources, or if needed, you can have mobile crisis come out and get dis be dispatched to where you are and presented in crisis. Um, so we really like to see how that hub, so to speak, really connects folks to all the services that they need. Uh, we have recently in the last fiscal year added um, our mobile response and stabilization services to our crisis response network. So that service is specifically tailored for our young um, folks, our child and adolescent population in uh, correlation with working with DSS and our school systems. We're identifying kids in the schools that are presenting as high need and getting them engaged with our mobile response team to have a network of <coughs> support happening before they're really in need of a full-blown crisis response. So that service is going to be rolled out in eight of the nine counties. We have seven that have initiated a rollout. Um, and in this coming fiscal year, we, we should have eight of the nine counties fully serviced. I will say the Kent and Queen Anne team for mobile response and stabilization services are at capacity and they have a waiting list. So that's another issue. You know, we have a great new resource, but they're already tapped out. So we're trying to figure out how to get more help um, in both Kent and Queen Anne County because the need is definitely still in there. All right, so quickly, just a, a review of when folks call the hotline, what is their primary need? Uh, so this is a breakdown of that. So really, much like we're seeing in our hospital data, the anxiety and depression is pervasive. That's really what's driving a lot of the calls for crisis here in the community. Um, we've also got a significant increase in our suicidal ideation calls and consistently uh, an update uh, increase in our child behavior, behavioral health needs, um, as well as just our chronic mental health needs. And we have served, uh, the, the image on the right just is a breakdown of our new calls as well as our, as well as our follow-up. So the hotline is busy and it's amazing. I, we don't realize how much work they're really doing and they're a very active uh, resource in the community. And the vendor for that is Affiliated Contours and they're represented here on the shore as well as um, in Baltimore County, um, Carroll County and Montgomery County. And they are very large providers in our state. And this is a breakdown of when someone needs mobile crisis to come out, 
are the uh, statistics for what that activity looks like. So we've actually seen um, DEP uh, in COVID, FY20 and 21, a high utilization of that service, which was a challenge to adapt to how to respond during COVID-19, but they certainly did it and we had success in there. So we're seeing that um, this data is, is FY23 is not complete, so that's nine months data. So at the conclusion of this fiscal year, we will get a higher response rate for mobile crisis than we did last year. Um, and for those that have been following, that system is going to be moving into a fee-for-service structure um, with some new regulations that have come out um, that could change what it looks like and how much utilization we're going to be able to achieve, but we'll have to wait and see what that impact changes in how we um, set up the structure of who is responsible for um, responding to individuals in the community. So I did break it down by age um, as well as gender. So you see that we've got primarily um, our 18 or 19 to 59 year olds are our primary population that we are serving in our mobile crisis response. And this is a breakdown by three years of primary presenting when uh, mobile crisis is dispatched. Um, so that anxiety and depression is the one that we see the most. We do see quite a bit of child needs as well as um, unfortunately a lot of family conflict too that generated some of that. Okay. Um, I'm gonna close out our data just with a little bit more information about our child and adolescent population. The um, slide up here is, a, is two ways of presenting the same information, but this is a more refined presentation of that emergency department information from Chris over a three year comparison. And you can see that the number um, has gone from an FY20, we had 515 individuals show up to the emergency department and then last year we were at 672 individuals uh, with the primary presenting need of depression and uh, transition and self-harm. So that was concerning. Um, and that same data is reflected in even the, the graphic here there. This information is information that Mitchor has collected. Um, we are responsible for sitting on all five of the local care teams here in the region, so I wanna give an acknowledgement to our local management boards and our local care team coordinators in the region because they were the ones that collected this data for us. Um, so we had some real-time data as of May 1st with the referral numbers for the local care teams. Um, and usually when a local care team meeting is gathered, it's as a result of a child presenting with high needs and assistance or a referral coming in from a community provider or the Department of Social Services. So these children really need all of us to come to the table and brainstorm how to help them. Um, so those are the referral numbers that we're seeing here in the region, which have definitely increased over the last couple of years. Um, and as a follow-up to that, a local care team is required to gather any time an individual is presenting and needing residential um, placement. Local care team comes together and determines that that is an appropriate referral for a child to be served in a residential um, setting. So the numbers that are presented are the referrals and placements to date um, for um, uh, residential placements. So this year we are at 10 um, to date. Uh, last year we were at 11 total and then the FY21 we had and that is not an easy system to get placed into. There's very limited beds in the state. Um, there's also, you know, it's, it's a lot of <laughs> process in terms of how it's funded and who's responsible for that individual once they enter residential treatment. And the length of stay at that level of care can be significant. Um, months, um, it's, 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 you know, three to six months is the normal average length of stay long time for a young person to be in a home. And 
this is uh, some information we've also collected with the um, help of our uh, school-based um, mental health coordinators. So I want to acknowledge all of those individuals here this morning with helping us get this data. So I really want to make sure that you all can pause and, and take this in. Um, the, the chart on the left with the green, um, that was as of November. systems with needs for mental health services. So as of November, we had 1,391 students served um, in the five counties in the school system. We had 91 threat assessments done and 201 suicide assessments done. I'm pretty confident that by the end of this fiscal year, that number will be substantially higher when we have the full data. Last year alone, um, the school saw 509 students for suicide assessments. Our schools are in desperate need of more resources. I know we are anticipating our consortium uh, funding coming out, more services coming into our school-based uh, program by way of the blueprint model. Um, but we, the need is there right now. So we're, we're trying to really get creative on how to meet those uh, needs in the schools. And to the right, those are our statistics for uh, our population that is being served by targeted case management, which is a reimbursable service. Um, we have a much higher um, average from what it looks like to the state, but that's only because we've combined all five counties. So that one number of the, um, let's see, the 13, I can't see the, the actual number, but the 13 percent is the total compared to the state. So that's the but on average, we do have a higher utilization of targeted case management services, which is a community-based service for schools. Okay, so this is just some food for thought <coughs> for our program and service needs. I sat down with my team, talked to lots of partners in the community, and we've generated a list, similar to the one that's on your agenda this morning, of what we don't have here in Reach. So these will help with the wheels turning. Um, we are in need of more inpatient mental health and substance use treatment for our ch child, adolescent, and young adult populations. We do not have a crisis stabilization or walk-in center in five local counties. Uh, Tidal Health down in Wicomico County has successfully launched their crisis walk-in center, and they also have a partial hospitalization program serving our youth, but that's the only uh, facility of its kind on the shore. In the state, um, all of our children that have substance use needs have to go elsewhere to get that service met because there is not a facility currently right now in the state that serves substance use treatment for our um, adult, child and adolescent population. So most of our eastern shore um, youth that need that service have to go to Delaware. So we're in strong relationships with Sun Behavioral Health as well as Dover. formally for our child and adolescent population. And we also don't have, as I mentioned, the substance use services, but we also need to have a resource available for medical detox. Um, our experimental therapies uh, are, are even just nothing unusual, but things like equine therapy. We have to advocate for utilization of our consumer support dollars to pay for that because insurance is not covering it extraordinary results with that level of care and that intervention. Um, so we're really advocating for parity and consideration of reimbursement with our insurance providers. We definitely need more school-based and community-based mental health providers. And of course, it goes without saying, anything we can do to reduce the utilization of our emergency departments is huge. Um, but the wait times that we're seeing, I know this is not new news, it's daunting how long um, our mental health and substance use population waiting in the emergency department to get placed in a treatment bed or just have an appropriate level of care is very concerning. Um, and I know that that wait time is significantly higher for our younger population. So um, 
a lot of heavy stuff. <laughs> That's why we're here to do the work, um, and we've got to do it together. So um, I hope this was helpful to really just provide an overview of what we're seeing here in our community. Well, uh, Brian, so first, Katie, I want to thank you for that, that very detailed presentation. There's a lot of data that was presented there. It may take some time to digest it, but yes, I apologize that, for the oversaturation. Um, <laughs> it was hard to, to hold back. What and I so, wanted to make sure it was a full representation. So I guess what I wanted to transition to, you know, sort of our speaker, you know, speaker input, uh, you know, listening session for our stakeholders. And I'm going to start off with uh, Deputy Secretary Brian Rose from the Maryland Department of Health. And uh, it's, it's all. You. And, and while we're at it, Carla, could you uh, pass the list of if you, if you're a speaker, please make sure that you sign up on the list so that we can get make sure that you have an opportunity. And if you are uh, you know attending remotely, please put a, a message in the chat box for us. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, before I even begin, I, I wanna thank Midshore Behavioral Health for that presentation and all the vital work that they do uh, on the Midshore and, and Eastern Shore. It's, it's incredible work that you do and your teams, please tell them thank you. Um, they probably don't get enough credit for all the work that they do, so, uh, and I know a lot of work goes into everything that you presented here, so thank you. Um, well, good morning. I'm glad. I'm very honored to be here uh, and joining you again as we continue to our discussions regarding the Upper Shore Community uh, Mental Health Center and, and our best uses for that. Uh, my name is Brian Moroz. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Operations for the Maryland Department of Health, and I am here today on behalf of our Secretary of Health, uh, Dr. Laura Herrera Scott. The Moore Miller administration is committed to tackling the long stigmatized behavioral health conditions, and they seek out solutions to strengthen our behavioral health continuum of care. Uh, <clears throat> this includes the supporting the good work that's happening here on the Eastern Shore and at the AF Whitsitt Center. This year in the 2024 budget, the Moore Miller administration included $107.5 million to strengthen the state's behavioral uh, continuum to help uh, <laughs> the behavioral health continuum of care. Um, I'm pleased to announce today that the Maryland Department of Health has allocated $4 million uh, to the AF Witsit Center to help with critical infrastructure, uh, infrastructure upgrades. Uh, hopefully this will strengthen our efforts at the, um, the community center and these funds will ensure the longevity of that facility. So I just want to say thank you for all your work and we continue to work together on the best uses for this facility. And uh, that was it. So thank you again for all the work that you're doing. Wow. But so that was a big it. But that was a big it. To, to <laughs> We well, uh, it, 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 it is deserved, it's needed. Uh, I, I think the, the Moore Miller administration, the Department of Health, has heard the concerns and needs and really wanted to support all the effort that's going on here. It's been great work, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I think that's fantastic so. news. <laughs> and recognizing that May is Mental Health Awareness Month, it is, you know, it, it, is, it is very consistent and, and you know, we're, very grateful for, mm -hmm. you know, the, the foresight and commitment of the, the Moore administration. That is that is absolutely fantastic. Um, okay, so uh, I guess the the next uh, I only have three names on this list for people who want to you know provide, you know you know provide input about what uh, and I, I know that there there's some opinions so. Uh, uh, the first person on the list is M Mr. Warren Wright, and I would ask that you come down and and speak into the microphone. I thought I was cleared. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you all very much for having the forum. I'm Warren Wright. I'm a volunteer for the Drug Free Coalition of Queen Anne's County. I did my due diligence before I came today because uh, I knew the commission would be here. That's one, two. Um, I speak. I spoke to the doctors that write the prescriptions. I spoke to the board of ed that make the referral, the health department, the people that make the referrals, um, so that we would know 
uh, how the Whitsitt Center in, is doing, and I would say unequivocally, everyone said the Whitsitt Center is, is really needed to continue with substance abuse, a detox unit, residential treatment, recover the wellness center, the peer groups, and to coordinate with the mental health and addictions just like they do now. Uh, they also said, although not a direct problem with the WITS, that there's a universal problem that we have that currently many providers do not take the client's insurance. Adolescents are sometimes treated as adults because there's no adolescent programs. Transportation in Queen Anne's County is a huge issue and the wait times are too long. Um, my purpose today, and I'm going to submit in writing, and I'll, I'll quote our sources, because we have uh, a couple of months ago the YRBS came out, and so all the counties have a pretty good picture of what the kids are saying in school. Uh, so I will be sending that, but it shows an increased need for an acute walk-in adolescent mental health services. The YRBS said, now some of you know that big study that said nationally one out of every three kids had mental health concerns. Well, in Queen Anne's County, our data shows that 20% of the middle school kids have issues that they thought about suicide or made a plan. In the high school, it was 19%. That's a pretty high degree for the adolescents, and so I think that's one of the things we really need. Uh, the other part is, as you know, July 1, something is happening. We're legalizing cannabis. Um, our kids in Queen Anne's County have you ever used uh, marijuana in the last 30 days? 30, 20% of the kids, that's 469 kids, they all said, yeah, that's a lot of kids. Cannabis is along a lot stronger. There's no THC limitation, so they get addicted much easier, and there's no place for them to go. There is one place in College Park, and if you can give away your kids' uh, first year of college money, you can go there. Uh, but other than that, sending them to Delaware, I think, for our midshore is probably not the best way to go. So uh, services for addiction for adolescents really needed. Mental health, adolescents really needed. I'm glad we're not at, uh, the Eastern Shore isn't at one and three, uh, but 20% is still kind of high. Uh, the, and the service certainly needs to be in a center where the buildings are, are have had a facelift and are, are good to, for the, receptive for the kids to go into. Um, the other thing is, as you know, the, the number of people that smoke tobacco is way down. It went from like 12% to 10% as a whole. Kids report in our latest study, have high school kids, every percentage you ever used an electronic vaping product for the last 30 days, once during the last 30 days, 24% of our kids. So that's not just tobacco. That's cannabis, and they can get the stuff right off the internet, so no big deal. But that, that's one in four kids that have said they've tried it in the last month in our county. So uh, the, since the nicotine is so much stronger, we need education or treatment short term for those kids to get them off the tobacco so we don't do the same thing we did 50 years ago because it's so much easier to be, become addicted. 98% um, of them prefer the flavors, by the way. Only 2% like the tobacco taste. Mr. Um, Wright, could you wrap up your comments? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll submit that in writing. Uh, and uh, except for the, Maryland, there was no adolescent psychologist in Queen Anne's County or the Eastern Shore, probably, that I can think of. Okay, thank thank you, you all very much, and I'll submit it in writing. Thank you. Okay. I don't know, uh, I have uh, Dr. Ciatola on the list. Okay. No comment. Okay. Um, do we have any other uh, officials that, that, and anyone else that would like to comment? Do we have anybody on Mr. Detmer? Yes. Can we slide, can we slide a microphone over? I'd like to say that the statistics, thank you for the, the presentation of statistics. The statistics bear out the need, and the anecdote from the county I view bears out the need. In the last two weeks, uh, there have been two uh, calls for service for overdoses in schools. I know that vape pen use in schools is, is rampant. I would suggest that um, some of the children in my community most in need probably aren't even reflected in those statistics. 
We all, you know, I have teenagers, we've been teenagers. It's a tenuous, stressful time. And I'm grateful to hear the Deputy Secretary's uh, expression of the more administration support. We, we have to have these strategic assets in place. We, we have to, in a world in which uh, health systems to take advantage of economy of scale, that services are being drawn away from these rural counties that are in such great need. We are a rural county that is in great need of this inventory, so uh, this, this is much needed. I don't have a comment, but I mean, uh, uh, I think we've they've done a great job of showing the need to here on the Eastern Shore. That's, I think that goes without question. But we, this is our, we started off this issue with uh, this piece of, this part of the facility was on the divestiture list. Mm -hmm. we, we had a meeting at the facility a month or two ago and you were present and you gave us the good news that it's now off the divestiture list. Correct. And we've had meeting today, and now you've allocated four million dollars to rehab that facility, which is uh, great steps in the right direction. I guess I'm, my question is, where do where do we go after that? I mean, is it is obviously you're not fixing it up to let it sit there. Um, is it um, do we have plans for it? Is that is that where we go from here? Trying to develop plans. I mean. Look, we, we just, uh, on our own, I guess, at one point had some conversations with different people that provide that type of service. Uh, um, and we had peop uh, companies or hospitals that were interested in performing the duties in that, if we could make some kind of arrangement. I'm sure there's others. Uh, we was no commitment or anything. We were just very interested to hear that there were hospitals that were ready to take over that facility if it was up and running and provide that service. Where where do you see us at as far as moving beyond the $4 million improvement? That, that's a great question. And I think I've set myself up for high expectations because every time I visit, I'm bringing better <laughs> news. So. <We're>, we <laughs> put you on the visitor list more, much more often than we um, are. So um, I, I think... This is, I think this is the next step, which is getting the community input. It, it's not, it, it's really a back and forth at this moment of what does the community need as opposed to coming in and dictating this is what it is, it is what is needed in that area, and let's start those discussions. But the first step we need to do was actually make sure the facility itself, the structure, would last and, mm -hmm. and, and go on and, and have longevity. So that's what that four million is, is to really build that up. Sure. But this is the next step, is really hearing the input from the community, hearing the providers, uh, what are the needs here, and let's start developing a, a common picture of what that place could look like moving forward. Uh, it's done great work already, and, and we really want to build on that. And that's where we are. Sure. So. Uh, and also from my personal perspective, uh, Bill may know this, but I'm a clinician who's worked with children and adolescents for 25 years. So hearing this need and hearing what's out there, it, it's near and dear to my heart also personally. But uh, in terms of the organization, in terms of the, the health department, we really want to hear from people right now about where it would like to, where it would like to go. to do infrastructure there's been some um, deferred maintenance that needs to be once you go on a di um, on a divestiture list you can't do that uh, um, maintenance that's needed so this will be really building the facility up to go forward in the future so and the, the heating and stuff if I'm not mistaken so part of the that, infrastructure that, that kind of takes yeah. care of the whole facility yes. and uh, you'd be not only would we be benefiting this piece of it, but we would be helping the entire facility. So, yeah. Yeah. We're probably, I'm thinking just a large portion of that $4 million would probably end up in that, from what I understand, in that heating and air conditioning and yeah, that, that's a big. So we, we had initial assessments of what the needs were. These were done a couple of years ago. We're redoing those. I think Department of General Services has already been out and done a survey of what this would need. So we're building that up, but uh, we knew that this would these are the funds that are needed to move it forward, but we can get you a breakdown of what that'll be in forward. So. Do you foresee that starting this year with the, the rehab that started this year? 
I am going to hold off on that question unless I'd like to defer it to Will uh, and Delora. I'm putting you on the spot, Will. <laughs> but could I get back to you on that? It is as soon as we can. I mean, the allocation of funds in the 2024 budget, uh, there's not much left in the 2023. You know, we don't have you know, a couple of days. So I think some of the background work is already underway. You know, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done before the shovels hit the ground or, or the maintenance crews come in and, <laughs> and change that over. So. But it's the 2024 budget. Thank you. Okay. I can just hold off on it. We'll get you more details as we go. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I guess, you know, we're here. And Katie, thank you very much. Please pass that out to everybody. Email everybody the, the statistics and the data there. It's awesome. I guess what we're looking for, and we, we know the $4 million is is for critical repairs right now. And thank you very much. Thank Governor Moore and, and everybody involved. Uh, it's It's... It's a true blessing, but we know that we need a lot more there. And I, I think what what, we're, what I'm hearing here is that we we know what now with some of the data that we have what we need at the Witsit, be it for mental health, be it for uh, recovery beds. Once we get what we feel, and I'm talking about the entire group of what it should look like. Is that something that we can bring back to the state? Because, I mean, ultimately the state is the ones that what we are anticipating is is going to fund the doctors, the therapists, and, and everyone else in the Witsit Center. So, I mean, I, I guess that's, what, you know, one of the things we're looking at is you know, we can come up with a plan, but we just don't have the dollars to implement the plan. And that's what we're hoping the state will be able to step in with that and, and help us in, in filling these ne critical needs on the Eastern Shore. Well, thank you. And, and we're absolutely looking for that back and forth conversation of what it would look like. Um, we've also heard from the communities, from the counties, that they want to be part of this. Um, and, and they can, you know, work with the, the state on, on what the direction that comes and ongoing support. So I don't have it set up right now because that's what we're doing uh, is, the, is the dialogue. But that's what we want to do is encourage that. I will just add, add in that the Upper Shore facility, when it was built in 1979 and opened, it was, it was you know, designed and built to be a multi-agency, uh, multi-purpose you know, facility focused on mental health services. And that certainly, you know, I think as we move forward and we're looking at the discussion of what specifically the services we seek to, you know, to have in the facility, you know, the implementation of those services, that's very much up for discussion. You know, will it be a nonprofit? Will it be the health department? Will it be a specialized provider? And really, for the purpose of our, you know, the tax dollars in the community, we want the highest quality services for the lowest price. And, you know, we want to make sure that, that those services are available not just you know today and tomorrow but five years down the road we know that mental health and mental illness frequently is a long-term lifetime you know lifetime illness that many of our citizens have to deal with and having having that keystone resource in the community is 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 important for the entire system of care and we're so grateful to hear that that the facility is not only off the divestiture list, that we're, that the Moore administration has, you know, committed $4 million. And one of the things that my experience in working in facilities is that once the facility is part of the Department of General Services inventory of facilities, there is an ongoing maintenance effort that, that happens as part of, you know, being in the facility. So, so you know, the, the additional, you know, upkeep and maintenance that as, as part of the state of Maryland inventory, that is, you know, that is part of the process of, of just being owned by the state, which is, which is fantastic news because they do a great job of maintaining, uh, you know, facilities uh, and they are a very, very important organ, you know, agency of the, the state of Maryland. So that's it. Thank you for letting me come. Do we have any, any other comment? Commissioner McLaughlin. Thank you. 
I may get into the weeds a little bit. Um, Patrick, speak up a little bit if you can. Is yeah. there a volume on this? No, no the volume is you. <laughs> <laughs> Find my voice, is that what you're that saying, it. Ronnie? That's it, we can turn you up. So if I may indulge a little bit and kind of get into the weeds of Katie's great presentation. Um, and I was looking at the numbers of uh, suicidal ideations and self-harm and depression and anxiety um, filling up our emergency rooms. And if I may share with you the, the uh, untangible thoughts that aren't a, aren't a statistic, I, I don't know why, but parents call me and they, they share with me what's going on, not all the time, but recently and in the last year or two, how, to Katie's point, you can't, they can't find, that their, their child is locked down in the emergency room and there are no beds available. And mom is sleeping in the, in the, in the uh, parking lot and days go by. The child is not really having their issues are not being addressed because you know they've only have one staffer in the hospital. In my mind's eye, the the benefit of the of you being so generous to rebuild the Witsit Center, the, the vacant part, is to create a crisis center for our youth and our adolescents, so that we can remove. I, I believe the statistic was almost fifty percent of of some people in the emergency rooms that have these, these ideations, instead of filling up the emergency rooms, they could come directly to the crisis center in Kent County and immediately start getting the treatment to, to be able to cope with their suicidal thoughts, with their self-harm, with their anxiety, with their depression, as opposed to waiting and ending up, you know, in Western Maryland or in, in uh, Shepherd Pratt. So I would just encourage us to think about that this would be the, the perfect place for a crisis center for our kids and would take a burden off of, off of the healthcare system and getting them immediate attention. And I know that's down the road, but we're here to talk about that too. So that's why I'm bringing that up. And you also mentioned uh, Sun Behavioral, which is a great place. That's out of network. So mom and dad that live in Maryland, now they've got to pay out of pocket to go. And it's, it, it's thousands, you know, if you're out of network going to Pennsylvania or Delaware because we don't have the resources, um, not just on the Eastern Shore. So that's my thought. I might just point out too during our conversations um, um, that, that we've had about this facility one and and I think uh, Jim touched on it a little bit is uh, we've talked about and and you as well had touched on the fact of the counties having some role in it or being a, a, te a team player regional uh, we've, we've regional sort of really look and, it, and I tell you that Whitsitt Center has been over I've been a commissioner for 25 years we've I've, that place is it's out there, the state runs it. We don't know, I've never had any involvement in it. Don't know much about it other than what, you know, what we're learning is, um, but when you're a part of something, you pay much more attention to what's going on. I give, and a, and a good example that I think we all relate to, at least five of the counties, and I think there would be more than five interested in this from what we understand, but there's five of, five counties of us that are part of Chesapeake College. Mm -hmm. We do things like air, air, uh, contras, air con the, the lion's share of that Chesapeake College is obviously paid for by state, federal money that, that they get, I guess. But we, we put some into the coffer um, based on how many people from each county visits that. Mm -hmm. And, it's a, and it, it's a very good re relationship, at least in my opinion. I think it's a model that we could possibly use when we're looking at something like this because um, it's all pretty well cut and dried. We're all, we all feel like we're uh, 
It's part of their, it's, it, we're part of it and we have some say in it. When we have our budget uh, every, every year, we all five counties show up for a budget presentation. It takes about 15 minutes and a good meal. Mm -hmm. And that's about, um, no, there's no arguing. We, it's, it's very cut and dried. We all know before we even get there what, what, what we owe. Um, none of us right now are filthy rich, uh, by no means. Uh, and I'm speaking for little old Kent County. Uh, we're struggling right now financially. But, but we, I think it would still be nice if we could all be a part of this and, and, and maybe a, um, help guide that facility to serve our counties the best it can. So we look forward to what, whatever plan you come up with, but I don't think you'd get much argument that our Chesapeake College way of doing things works pretty good. Just yeah. something to look at. Yeah. To the commissioner's point, there's actually six counties here. Dorchester, oh, yeah. Cecil, it's, it's, it's. Councilwoman Gregory's on the phone. Uh, but his his regional thought is is right on, and and no disrespect, but as administrations change, mm -hmm. funding changes, mm -hmm. so it's vacant now because mm -hmm. someone in the state government said, you know, we don't want that, and they 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 stopped. So we have living proof of what can happen if if there's not regional input and, and almost regional control to make it work from a five or six county approach. I'm not looking at another thing for Kent County to have to pay for right now with our budget, believe me. But that having some skin in that game mm -hmm. is worth some, some type of an investment to some degree. Again, all of these are great ideas and we want to hear them and I, none of those are, are closed off. We really want to hear every proposal there is. It's not about what uh, we come up, it's not about what the state comes up with, it's about what we come up with for and that, that uh, facility. That. Yeah. And I think that's where we're headed. And um, to go to your point, you mentioned something very crucial about uh, the child and adolescent. It's a continuum of care and uh, that 107.5 million includes that continuum of care because it's not just that moment in the hospital, it's what happens before then that maybe we could have intervened. What is happening in the hospital? What's gonna happen after and what are we gonna do to prevent them from coming back <clears throat> is that full continuum of care and, and that would and it'd be one crucial part. So I, I love the idea, uh, I'd like to hear more about it and uh, like to hear all the suggestions that we have. And then we need to come up with an actual plan uh, going forward that we all agree on, so. That'd be great. You're right, it, it's PHP, it's IOP. It's everything. And long term mm -hmm. which we're not really talking about that but I mean that's but that's a that's a piece of the puzzle you know a year yeah. or more but uh, a one week three weeks four weeks inpatient facility at the Witsit Center mm -hmm. to get them stable then they go into a PHP program and then they go into an IOP and then they go into outpatient mm -hmm. and the goal in my mind's eye is so that they don't end up at the Witsit Center, so that they don't end up homeless, that we, we, we get to them with their, with their parents. I tell you, when, we, when, when it was first, when that facility was first on the divestiture list, we just sat around and kind of scratched our heads because we thought, you know, you can't turn a TV on or turn anything on or t have a conversation with anybody the issue of mental health doesn't come, doesn't surface. And uh, uh, we just, we, 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 we had the feeling that things would turn around with this facility and it, it certainly is heading in that direction. So we're, we're excited about that. I, I, th thank you I'm for this. I, I want to uh, um, take, the, take a moment. Do we have anybody who wants to speak remotely? I, I, I can't really see if their chat boxes uh, if if you are attending the meeting remotely and you would like to comment, please please chime in at this point. Okay. One of, one before we wind up, Delegate Jacob, did you want to make any comment or or address the? If I if I could, first of all. Uh, Thank you guys from cu for coming over, making the trip on Friday. I hope you didn't get hung up on the bridge very long. And 
it's uh, it's always a challenge on Fridays, isn't it, uh, Commissioner Moran? <laughs> but uh, sincerely, I uh, want to pass the uh, thanks on to Secretary Scott for taking this facility off the, off the list to begin with, and the good news today that that you've come out with some investment uh, into that. That building, I think you, if you can admit from your visit there, it, it really does have good bones. There's virtually no uh, conflict with the community, as Commissioner Fithian has said, uh, and, and that I know of. You know, no one even knows it's really there. And that's the good news, because if you have to build one of these places, it'd be very difficult anywhere. I mean, it, it's just a NIMBY issue. and. And so I'm, I'm happy to see the investment. I'm very thankful the Moore Miller administration. We've had some conversations, and I'll be over next week and personally thank the governor uh, for his commitment and continued, I'm sure, we'll, what will be continued. Uh, as you can see, the, the need is really there. Uh, it's, it's daunting to see some of these numbers. And, uh, you know, we've with the legalization of marijuana coming here July 1st, you know, there's going to be some more issues, I'm sure, that are going to be forthcoming, and um, hopefully, you know, we'll be prepared to uh, face whatever the challenges are that we've seen today and, and may be coming in the future with your help, continued help. So thank you very much, um, and please convey that message to the administration. I'm thank you. To. Thank you. Okay, I, I, if there are th no other comments, I think that, that you know, we're sort of winding down to our, our appointed um, end time of 1130, but if before we cut it short, I do want to remind everybody that for those who couldn't attend, that we are taking written input f from anyone in the community who, who would like to, to voice their, you know, their opinion of what should happen at the shore, uh, please send it to the Kent County Health Department to my attention. Uh, I also have an email address that's listed on a presentation that will be included with the minutes of this, this meeting. Uh, my email address is william.webb at maryland.gov. We welcome uh, the input uh, because this is a community resource. This is a regional resource and, and we have we have a lot of need, and we do want to hear from all parties about what what you think we should do and how we should do it at that facility. So thank you. Bear with um, Ms. Kimberly Cradiville, who has entered her in attendance via online, and she wanted to thank you for bringing down and making this important conversation. Um, Very good. Time. Thank you. Mayor Foster. My understanding is that there will be minutes that will be posted from this meeting. It will include the presentations. It will also include the presentation that I've, I put together as an introduction that, that uh, uh, we didn't see, but that, <laughs> my fault. Uh, but that, that will be included and it, the slides will also be included. And I think that that provides an excellent snapshot of what has happened in the behavioral health arena for the Midshore region and you know, also to our neighbors to the north in Cecil County. Cecil County has has uh, you know has a unique you know set of challenges, and they they are doing great work in the SUD arena, and you know don't want to forget about you know their needs and their their interests as well, because you know Cecil County is an important. The residents there are important, and you know frequent they, they come to the Witsit Center. Um, you know, we serve a lot of folks from there, so so they're they're important too. So thank you. And I'll turn the meeting back over to you. Well, and and if there's nothing else, uh, we can we can adjourn the meeting, I guess. But uh, thank you all okay, again. Thank we, you. Thank you.